<laughs> Let's just rise and come together and, and uh, heal the front views. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God for the first Sunday of the brand new year 2019. Amen. 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 <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I believe we had a wonderful time. Uh, the watch night service and uh, uh, the tone is set for us for a new year to to walk with the Lord. Hallelujah. I've chosen as a theme for this 2019. I know whom I have believed. Amen. I know whom I believe. That is from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 uh, by Paul. I know whom I have believed. I, I remember when I was uh, growing up in elementary school, it must have been, I think, the fourth or the fifth grade. Uh, in those days, uh, we lived in the military barracks. My father was in the army at the time. And we lived, uh, the quarters, you know, they have these blocks and blocks and blocks of, you know, military personnel in cubicles, you know, uh, hall and chamber type of uh, facility and uh, and I remember in those days uh, the military used to conduct some kind of uh, I don't know what to call it but <laughs> inspection of sort you know it's a drill yeah they, they, will, they will come in the uh, into the barracks Every family's uh, residence, you know, they'll go door to door. And on the veranda, you know, every, every uh, apartment has a veranda, you know. Uh, you set up your military uh, hardware, you know, uh, that the backpack, you know, the water bottle, you know. It's a whole few things. And then I think uh, there is a, a bayonet. You know, a few things, you know, to set it up. There's a way to arrange it on the on the floor. First, you put a green blanket on the floor, and then they do all that. It's a special military blanket. And you have to do it in such a way that it has to be very neat. And in those days, uh, uh, how do you call uh, They had uh, some community organizers. Uh, the women uh, will make sure they have somebody who is the leader, the head of the women, uh, the wives, the soldiers, they call them magazia, you know, it's like, <laughs> they will organize uh, the women, the community to sweep the compound. In there. Because the whole thing is, is, is it has to be clean, disciplined, everything must be neat, everybody must be dressed. In fact, if your children are in the house that day, uh, you got to make sure they are, you know, taking a shower, everything, you are dressed nice and you sit there, you know, because when the officers come by to inspect and they find any problem, you know, anything that is questionable, that day your father <laughs> or your husband <laughs> is in trouble. They will make him go to the square and, you know, run around so many times carrying a rifle like that, you know. So it, it was kind of like, you know, <laughs> man. <laughs> and... Uh, I I remember at that time, our next door, uh, actually not directly next door, probably about two or three flats between us. I was a very young soldier, very, very young man, uh, as I recall, very young man. He must have been in his 20s at best, yeah. I think he must have been a very young man. But he bragged a lot about being spiritually strong man. Uh, so he dealt very much in voodoos, you know. And uh, so on one of those inspections, uh, we observed that the officers that were, you know, going door to door to do, you know, they were taking time. It was dragging 
because they found some problem somewhere, you know, trying to address it, you know, because they have to go block by block, block by block. And when this is happening, the whole neighborhood is just quiet, you know. So um, this young soldier, you know, came to my father because my father, you know, at the time, he also uh, kind of, he believed in this kind of things, you know. And uh, this man came and told my father, you know what? Uh, this officer today, he is not going to complete his assignment. By the time he gets to my, you know, my neighbor, he's going to turn back and say, I'm tired. Wow. Man. <laughs> and he was carrying a talisman, and he put it um, under the blanket somewhere, you know, on his veranda, you know. So... We're all waiting, waiting, waiting. This officer was going. And uh, usually the officer has maybe two or three other, you know, people who are kind of like his bodyguard or whatever, you know. So they were going. They went that block. They came this block, and they come in this block. Man, and as a child, you know, like, because I was very young, elementary school, must have been fourth or fifth grade. And, and the officer came all the way, and he was now at... Just the next flat to him, that young man's flat. And he kind of took a while trying to sort things out over there. And when he finished, it was just a shocking situation. He just said, well, you know what? I'm tired. You know, I'm going. You know, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it. That was it. I'm telling you, that thing made this young man very popular. Because it's indicated that what he was practicing, he believed in it, and it was very effective, very powerful. So we didn't get to be checked that day, you know. It was, uh, you know. And this young man, uh, as far as I recall, you know, he, 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 he practiced this kind of thing until we were moved from the barracks to another location. Anyway, I'm saying this to make a point that it is important that we believe in what we do. Amen. You got to believe in what you do. Um, I don't know, but like when we come here and we study the Bible and we pray, for instance, I don't know how many of you even speak in tongues, you know, like, when we come here and we speak in tongues, we are praying because it's, it's a corporate time. I don't know how many people even speak in tongues with conviction. Or even when you're praying to God, you, are you doing that with conviction? What is it that is driving uh, your behavior when you come into this environment? You know, uh, this year, I think I told you uh, um, that I want to spend some time to try to educate ourselves, you know. And I bought a book. Um, it's, 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 it's a str strong academic book, but I'm not going to go that route. I'm just reading for uh, setting strong uh, points that will emphasize the truth in the scriptures so that I can communicate this. But uh, our general theme, like I said, for the year is I know whom I have believed. And so I want to start with that from today and as the Lord gives me opportunity, I would like to uh, glean some information from different sources uh, of the book, different chapters, and try to communicate this. Uh, and of course, I, I also just allow the Holy Spirit to direct me and infuse things that I, you know, he deems necessary just to make the message complete. All right, so... Uh, so this title is just going to be the theme for the year. I know whom I have believed. And I want us to, first of all, look at a few things. Number one is that there is an ongoing conspiracy, whether you accept it or whether you believe it or not, against the Church of Jesus Christ. You know, um, there are three main ways that I have identified that I think that uh, can throw some light on this assertion. First of all, that 
the influence of our culture, you know, uh, the science, education, uh, the media, the arts, um, uh, medicine, law, and all this knowledge that we're pursuing, technology, you know, uh, as we go in deeper and deeper, you find that there is no space that has been created for anything that has to do with the spirit of man. It's all about how we can become great and bigger and stronger and powerful. At the, at the end of the day, that is all there is to it. And so we are all striving. We are all just kind of uh, fighting to obtain, to acquire, to possess, you know. Because this is what we have come to believe as a people, you know. And so uh, what has developed over the years is that uh, our great thinkers of the culture in which we live have put aside uh, the biblical framework in observing things that are in the world. In other words, people no longer want to incorporate the doctrines of the Bible, the teachings of the Bible, uh, because we have become so politically correct. We got to satisfy everybody, so we leave Christianity out. We don't see it as very, very relevant. We see other al alternatives, and so we want to please everybody. So uh, Jesus Christ is being silenced and is being taken out of the picture. That is why our culture is becoming more and more ungodly. Number two. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I believe, some perception of the world community that we Christians don't really know what we are about. That the faith that we profess is just a fairy tale. It's just fiction. Okay? Um, so... A lot of us who go to church, a lot of us who uh, carry the Bible, it is because we have challenges in our lives. We have struggles, so we need some help, and, you know, we don't, we're trying to find help, in, you, know, you know, but uh, they, they try to make it seem like it is because we are helpless, and we need some kind of, so least, and so this becomes our escape. I want us to look at something in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It says, the former treatise have I made. This is, was written by Dr. Luke. And there were so many different people who wrote the scriptures. Uh, this is one of them. He is a doctor, but we know that there were others who were fishermen, um, different people. Sh some were shepherds, you know, in the Old Testament and stuff like that. But this man, he was a doctor, and this is his account. It says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard, of me. Amen. And so we know that Luke was speaking concerning Jesus and he wanted to make his point because he had encountered Jesus and he wanted to make his point very clear. And if we look at Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, please. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. It says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order to, 
in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were our witnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein in thou hast been instructed. Amen. And so, uh, Christianity actually is based on facts, some events that happened and were witnessed by living people, people who live on this earth. So it is not something that just happened out of, you know, uh, space. It is not a myth. It is truth. It happened. So anytime we are handling the Bible, anytime we are talking about the scriptures, we must carry it with some assurance and certainty in our hearts that this is gospel. This is true. You know, if we have that approach, it makes our faith in the Lord more solid. So when you hold on to the word of God, you know that you are dealing with something which is real. I believe that if uh, a man leaves some legacy for his children and the man passes on and the wealth is, you know, passed on to the children, and they have access to it. There is nobody who is going to say that you don't have that wealth. It is a fact. The documents will be there to indicate that it belonged to them. So they can decide to use it anyhow they want. You cannot tell them that, oh, it does not belong to you because you are not your father. No, no, no. It has been passed on. It is truth. Hallelujah. So we also have received something that has been passed on to us. By people who were just like us. And they made sure that they presented it to the next generation. And the next generation. And the next generation. And it has come to us. Now we also have received the word. But do we believe it? Are we carrying it with certainty in our hearts? To present to the world that this is life? So the second point I want to just establish here is that. The world is trying to say that we are dealing with something that is fictitious, something that is not true, you know. I remember when I was in high school, uh, you know, uh, some of the, my peers in, in the, in the, in who were in the dormitory, because we all uh, we had a, a boarding school, and uh, there were some of the students in the dormitory, they were making fun of us, those of us who were attending the scripture union, and they were making fun. I've forgotten one of the songs, but one of the songs that they will, you know, they will take it and be clapping their hands and, and be making mockery of us that, you know, because we, we, we are just thinking about just going to heaven, or, you know, uh, whatever we are suffering here on earth, you know, something like that, you know, just making fun of the whole thing like it is not a reality, you know. And sometimes it can be very embarrassing when you don't know the whole truth. And so to be a Christian can be a challenging thing in this culture and society. Number three, uh, which is to me perhaps the most important thing is that uh, the world in which we live does not believe that Jesus lived, died, and rose again from the dead. This is the key, the cornerstone of our faith. I wonder how many of us believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. You can see how in the Western world, you know, um, when it comes to Christmas, there's a lot, millions, billions of dollars spent in commercial activity, such as what we just experienced in the past few weeks. A lot of gifts flowing, going back and forth. Is that all Christmas is about? But when it comes to Easter, just watch it. You don't see any commercials. You don't see anything that has to promote the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection. Because they don't believe in that. So it is not promoted. It is not pushed forward for people to know that this is life. And so Christ is regarded as weak. So you and I, do we really believe that Christ rose from the dead? 
Is he alive today? When you read the gospel, especially the book of Acts, you realize that the reason why they were persecuting the Christians is because they were talking about a resurrected Jesus Christ. Christ died. Everybody saw it. He was buried. Soldiers were assigned to guard and protect that tomb. And then Jesus escaped or whatever, you know. He rose again. And the soldiers went back to the authority to say that when they were sleeping, the disciples came and stole him away. I mean, they just concocted a story. And that is how the world is today. They want to make it impossible for people to believe that Jesus truly is alive. If we as a church, Gateway Chapel, can move in our heart and in our mind from unbelief and doubt to a place where whatever we do here, we, we do it with utmost conviction. I believe the move of God in our hearts and in this church, in our homes and our situations will be awesome. Hallelujah. The hymn we're singing, the Shokwala, when we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He sheds on our way. When we walk with Him, He sheds glory. Glory is light in this world of darkness. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. So, the church we are conducting in this environment, it is not about being just churchgoers or feeling good. This is not a club, I say it all the time. But we want to be identified as people who have faith, who have believed in an invincible God. But who is truly at work in our lives? To anyone who will believe in him, hallelujah. So we should be able to say with Paul, I know whom I have believed. Hallelujah. This must be our challenge. And this must be our pursuit throughout this year. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want us to read 1 verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 12. Paul speaking, he says, Now if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. When he raised, not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are falling asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Amen. Simply put, Paul is saying that man, if this gospel we are preaching about the resurrection is just a farce, it's just some kind of story you're making up, then, you know, we are of all men most miserable. I know there are archaeologists out there who are trying to uh, locate and uh, identify certain things that have been mentioned in the Bible, which, you know, uh, is yet to be discovered. You know, some people want to see something before they believe or, or I, you know, either way, to disprove that even the gospel ever existed. There are those who don't believe that even there was uh, an ark that God built uh, or Noah built according to God's instruction. They don't believe that. There, there are so many people who don't believe that even there was anything called a, 
uh, Ark of the Covenant that was carried by uh, the Israelites in the wilderness. People have been searching, trying to locate this place somewhere on the surface of the earth. You know, people are trying to do all kinds of things, you know. And uh, sometimes it's kind of interesting because God is invincible. So I don't know how by searching for him, you can just find him in a specific location. Hallelujah. It's a spirit, he, he's a spirit being. And so with our limited minds, we are unable to uncover everything about him. But he has revealed himself to us through the scriptures. And those who believe God makes life so meaningful to you. And you find so much comfort in this journey of life. Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 1, the same chapter. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was raised, sorry, he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You can see that he's repeating that according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. So these are facts. These are documented facts. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Hallelujah. He says that all these people saw Jesus when he rose again from the dead. Then he says that I also, I saw him, feely, feely. Hallelujah. I saw Jesus. But look at the phrase he uses over there in verse 9, the latter part. He says, because I persecuted the, uh, sorry, verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also. So he is testifying to something that is real to him. Hallelujah. And he says that be, uh, as of one born out of what? Due time. What Paul is trying to say is that, you see, Jesus came to the Jews, the Israelites, and he was rejected as a nation, and he was crucified. So God gave Christ to the world, the Gentile world, so that he would make the Jews or the Israelites jealous of the things that they will see now God doing in the life of the nations or the Gentiles. But Paul is saying that God allowed him to have a glimpse of what he intended for the nation of Israel. So he says that he allowed me to see him as of one born out of due time. Hallelujah. Because there is going to come a time when the time of the Gentiles is going to come to an end. And then God will now turn his focus on the nation of Israel. And we believe according to the scriptures this is going to be during the time of the tribulation, when the nation of Israel will begin to see that, wow, there is truly an Antichrist who has come to set things out of order, and Christ will appear and destroy the work of the enemy. Hallelujah. And as a nation, as a nation, they are going to accept this Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Hallelujah. But before then, he is saying that, I have been allowed that rare opportunity to see this Jesus Christ. And he's the one I am declaring to you with conviction. It is real. It is true. Hallelujah. Church of God, if we are going to be a light in this community, if we are going to be the salt in this community, then we better be authentic. God did not bring us into this environment just because he couldn't take care of us wherever we were originated 
Most of us are from Africa. Is it because God could not feed us in Africa? No. I believe that in the grand scheme of things, God has a time, plan, and purpose for everything that he's doing. Hallelujah. So our position here today, it is not just by chance. It is God who has planned and orchestrated that we should gather in this place to be light unto the darkness that is in this world. Hallelujah. And so we must do it with conviction. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Amen. Paul said that if what we are hearing today, if what he's saying to them, they don't, they don't uh, believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, then our, our, our faith is really, really in vain. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. We want to talk about a little bit about the Paul's defense of his faith. You know, he, he had to really, really go through a lot to defend the faith that he had committed himself to. At the peril of his own life, you know. And let's just allow the text to speak to us. Acts chapter 23, verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So our conscience is very important, you know. Conscience. I have, ser- I have served, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then <laughs> said Paul unto him. You know, that statement he made kind of like, I think in their culture it was very disrespectful. Because... It sounded like Paul is trying to say, look, I'm a smart guy, you know. I know what I'm talking about. You know, you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> you know. So that's why he was struck on the mouth, you know, because uh, he was before some dignitaries. And Paul acknowledged, he didn't know that the high priest was one of them, you know, so he apologized. Anyway, verse 3, he says, Then said Paul unto them, God shall smite thee, thou, what? Whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was a high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of the people. But when Paul received, perceived that the one part where Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. Hallelujah. So the main reason why Paul was brought before the council was because he was preaching in the synagogue talking about the fact that Jesus is alive. And this does not sit well with people. How could it be? He died. He was crucified. He's alive today and he's, he's working amongst men. It did not make sense. And that is what we've been asked to spread around today. And how do we do that? It is not only by word of mouth, but by our conduct, our behavior. That is what the Lord is asking of us, to be able to bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, and when he has so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confessed both. 
And there arose a great cry. The scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in the man, but if a spirit of an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, tearing, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Amen. And so the picture is very clear. Because of what he was declaring about Jesus, that he's, he's risen from the dead, you know, and that is alive today. Uh, it created uh, an uproar, you know. Uh, the multitude were divided into two because there were two sects, Pharisees and Sadducees, and they all had their own faith based on the law. And one group believed that, yes, Jesus believed, uh, raised from the dead. Another group believed that, no, 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 that did not happen. You know, so uh, there was a great contention. And those who were against him, uh, the Bible says that their purpose was to do what? To pull him into pieces, not allowed to kill him. They were going to, they were going to crush a mob action. They were going to destroy this man. You see, that's how strong his conviction was, and that is what it attracted. It brought a lot of, you know, rage from the community, but it was for a good cause, because he was parading the truth before the people, and he was willing to die for it. Hallelujah. Verse 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they will neither eat nor drink till they had what? Killed Paul. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and rulers and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat Nothing until we have slain Paul. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you can see that when the devil is in any community and he's actually against light, he can do anything. He can move people to do anything. Because sometimes when we see the news, you know, it's very strange how people can just do stuff that they do. For instance, people just driving by and shooting and killing. Or somebody just going into a church and then killing people, you know, randomly like that. Or going to a public place or school, you know. All these things we see happening. Because when the spirit of darkness begins to enter a man and convince him and possess his mind and begin to manipulate. Because he or she has willingly given himself. He or she believes in it and begins to act it out. And the result is devastating. If we also will believe in Christ and walk in the faith that we have received, I believe the power of heaven will be released in a powerful way to validate the faith that we profess. Hallelujah. Because God is ready. He's ready. He's the one who will defend himself. And the gospel. Praise the Lord. So we need to have a clean conscience. Like Paul said. I have lived. In all good conscience. Before God. Unto this day. Get with chapel. You and me. What kind of conscience do we have? What kind of conviction? Because conscience is your conviction that you have internally. And which directs your behavior. That is revealed, you know, externally or which is seen on the outward. So our outward behavior is a result of the things that we believe inside of us. So when we go out into the community, the way we conduct ourselves is a reflection of the conviction that we have in what we are teaching and believing in this place. Hallelujah. He says, I believe in all. I have lived in all good conscience, you know. Before God until this day. May that be our possession as well. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Acts 
Acts chapter 24, verse 14. He says, By this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Amen. Let's go back to 14. But this I confess unto thee. You know, Paul is before the authorities and is defending the faith. He is talking about his conviction. He is prepared to die for it. And he's saying that, look, that after the way which they call heresy, when you read the Bible, you come across that two word, the way, which is uh, coming from Jesus, following Jesus, because Jesus was the first person who said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. And so anytime they are talking about the way, they are talking about Jesus Christ, that he is the answer to human's problem. Hallelujah. He is the solution. He is, is the one that we have to go to. Paul said that, this is my confession about the way which you are calling heresy. In other words, you are, you are saying that talking about Christ is something that is worthless and, 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 and worthy of what? Some condemnation. But he says that I worship the God of my fathers. Hallelujah. I worship the God of my fathers. You know, that means that the tradition has been brought down and he has received it and he has believed it and he's practicing it. Hallelujah. You and I have also received the gospel which has been brought down to us. Our forebears, they have gone ahead of us. They have borne uh, the cross. They have, they have labored so hard. And as a result of that, the gospel has been passed down to us. Paul said that I worship the same God that they did. And I'm believing in all things which are written in the law. Hallelujah. I believe all things which are written in the law. So you realize that if you can begin to read the Bible consistently with an attitude of this is truth and I believe it, whatever is telling me, God is going to honor his word in your life. Hallelujah. He says, I am believing all things that have been written in the scriptures. Amen. Look at verse 5, the same chapter, Acts 24, verse 5. For we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. This is how they are describing Paul when he was before uh, the governor. We have found this man, a pestilent. A pestilent is like a disease. Okay, that Paul's behavior has become like a disease that is catching everybody in the community. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that be so good that in this community, that everywhere you go, in the shopping center, in the community, I mean, everywhere we go, people are talking because something is happening in our lives. And it, it is amazing. It is drawing some curiosity and people are beginning to ask questions. Is that truly a God? Maybe I have to come and worship this God of the people who go to Gateway. Hallelujah. It must catch them like a disease that they cannot let go. Hallelujah. And the only way that they can be cured from that disease is when they accept Jesus. Hallelujah. It says Paul's activities was, was, was so impactful that they were accusing him of a pestilence, being a pestilence, because his actions was causing a lot of impact. People were believing. It was, he was changing the mindset of a lot of people all over in the then known world. And he says, he's a fellow, he's a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. Okay? A mover of sedition. That is insurrection. Somebody who is like a coup d'etat. A ringleader. Huh? Of the sect of the Nazarenes. We know that Jesus was from Nazareth. Hallelujah. He says, because they are referring to Jesus. They don't even want to mention the name Jesus. But he has said the sect of the Nazarenes. Because they know that that's where Christ came from. 
So this Jesus is something that they don't want to deal with at all. Paul represented Christ in a very solid, positive way. And that is what we must aspire to accomplish in our lives, in this community, as God allows us grace to live. Hallelujah. That our actions should cause people to be infected, that they cannot let go. That they will think about us, talk about us. And anytime they are talking about us, it's not because of how popular we are, but it is because of the Christ that we preach. Hallelujah. That they will know that Christ is real in our lives, that he is truly a healer, a savior, a deliverer. Hallelujah. That is what Paul was doing. Second Timothy chapter 2. Chapter 1, sorry. Second Timothy chapter 1. Paul made a number of statements in this chapter, and I just want to bring that to your awareness. Verse 1. Paul speaking, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of, the, of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of, of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hallelujah. Paul is speaking with conviction over here. Hallelujah. First of all, he's talking about the promise, verse 1 promise. There's a promise. He's dealing with a promise. A promise that God has given. What is the promise you are dealing with? The promise that we have is the word of God. Hallelujah. It's a covenant keep. That has, you see, it was established by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus has been spilled on the word. And God's word can never lie. Hallelujah. He says, on the basis of this promise, I have committed everything unto him against that day. Hallelujah. I believe in this. He says, I know whom I have believed. Hallelujah. He says that uh, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience. Hallelujah. In other words, I'm not the first person to be professing this faith. I'm not the first individual to be talking about this gospel. I'm not a first person to be explaining these things to you. My forefathers, people in the past, in ages past, they have believed the truth. God has kept and, and, and worked miracles. In fact, if you go uh, later in the book of Acts, you see how Paul was, uh, uh, Peter was declaring how God took the Israelites from Egypt. He talked about Abraham. He talked about, I mean, a whole lot of stuff in the book of Acts about the prophets of old. Hallelujah. And Paul said that I have believed 
in the same God that they have believed. Hallelujah. And he says that, you know, because of all these things, I want to remind you that you stir up the gift of God that is in you. When I lay my hands on you, the faith that is in you is an active faith. He says God has given you the spirit of love and power and of a sound mind. And he goes on to say that this faith is based on God's own purpose. That was in verse 9. His own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Hallelujah. Before the world began. The world in which we live today that people are bragging about and talking like there is no tomorrow. And feel that they are the most powerful people on the surface of this earth. God is saying that before the world began. That is God our Father. Hallelujah. He says that he has a purpose for our lives. And if we are going to walk according to that divine purpose, he will bring to pass his grace to make these things happen. Hallelujah. He says to Timothy, you know, Timothy, I've been going through some stuff. And I want you to be uh, 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 assured that I am not ashamed at all. Hallelujah. Because Paul was beaten so many times. He was put before, uh, 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 how do you call uh, uh, the Sanhedrin, he had to answer questions many times. I mean, so many times, a lot of bad things happened to him. But he says, don't get, don't be ashamed because of my, 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 my situation. Don't, don't lose heart because I, 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 Paul, I know who I believe. Hallelujah. He says, I am persuaded that he's able, he's able, he's able to keep that which I have committed. Hallelujah. What are you committing unto the Lord? When you commit all your ways unto the Lord. Trust that he will bring it to pass. Hallelujah. Second Timothy chapter 4. Let's look at verse 6. I'm going to rush through this passage here. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Hallelujah. And so the question is, are you also hungry, waiting for the appearing of Jesus Christ? Because the world as it is today is not going to be like this forever. Christ is going to come again. He's going to come again. He says that those who have died in Christ, they are going to rise first and ascend into the class of glory and meet with him. He says we are going to be with Jesus for that thousand years. Where there will be peace, there will be no evil on the surface of this earth. A great day is coming. What we see around doesn't offer us any hope at all. I mean, there are billions and billions and billions, I mean, of, of, of dollars being spent on weapons of destruction. While people are hungry, homeless, and people are killing one another just because they want a little bit of wealth. And they have no access to it. So they kill so that they can get. But all these things are going to come to an end one day. Hallelujah. Paul said that I have what? Fought. A good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That is what we ought to do. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Let's go to verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. What happened? I want to you to put that passage there so that you can see. But let me just go down this late list uh, in that passage we are reading. Paul is making a claim concerning uh, his, his faith and conviction in Christ. Number one, he says that the time has come for me to depart. Because at the time he wrote this letter, he was in prison. And he kind of felt that, well, the end has come. I'm going to be killed. You know, and he was writing this letter to encourage Timothy. So this is somebody who has lived all his life. You know, uh, after he became born again, after he became saved, he lived with total conviction. That's why he says that in all conscience, in all conscience. Let's continue. Uh, where were we? Verse 10. 
Go to verse 10. He says, oh, go to 9. He says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. 10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Christians to Galatia. That's Titus unto just pause here. So this is Paul. You can see his humanity being revealed here. This is a man who has fought so hard for the faith, going around and preaching and trying to exhort and you know strengthen people. But it got to a certain time that he was going through a very, very difficult time when he was being persecuted. And some of the people that he had raised up, they began to turn against him because it's like they're saying, hey, if you say that you are somebody so powerful with so much revelation, how come you are having all these problems? How come they are putting you in jail? You know, how, what is the God? That kind of thing. You know, people will make mockery of you because of your faith. Thinking that because you say you're a Christian, you're not supposed to face hardship. So he says, Demas, he has what? Forsaken me. Hallelujah. I pray that this church will stand by each other. Hallelujah. Because we believe in what we believe and proclaim. Then go to verse 11. He says, only Luke is with me. Huh? Isn't that comforting? Just look. You remember Luke? <laughs> Luke is the one who wrote and he was talking about his conviction that he has also taken upon himself to, to write to Theophilus about what he has witnessed. He says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. I pray that we will be profitable to each other. Hallelujah. When I'm around you and when you're around me, let my good deeds and, and, and the work of Christ, let it rub on you and let your good ones rub on me. Hallelujah. At the end of the day, we must all become stronger in the Lord. Verse 12. He says that, And Tychus, uh, what Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. 13. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books especially, the partners. You know, so again, I just want to go through all this so that you see certain things that were happening in uh, Paul's life. Number one, uh, some were departing from him. They were some of the best friends of the people that he raised in the faith. They kind of departed. You see, they left him. But it says that there were some who actually stood with him. And then he was saying that, okay, when you are coming to me, bring me the books and the parchments. You know, this is somebody who spent time studying constantly the word of God. Always wanting to know the things that have been written concerning Jesus Christ. That is why we must take time to read the scriptures for ourselves. Hallelujah. He was asking them, bring me the books and the parchments. I need to be reading. I need to keep studying. Because this one that I am following is the real deal. And I'm not going to let go. Hallelujah. Verse 14. He says that Alexander, the copper smith, he did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his own works. Hallelujah. You know, this is somebody who had mistreated him. And it, it, it is very painful. And we experience that sometimes in life. But look at what he's saying. Look at his approach. He says that the Lord reward him according to his own works. In other words, he's not taking matters into his own hands. Hallelujah. He's leaving him to God. Ah, just two nights ago, a man came to me and he asked me. I read in Psalm so, so and so. That uh, God teaches my hand to war and, and to do battle and something like that, you know. So what does that mean? You know? And I could just sense from his question that he, he, he was trying to find a way to maybe deal with some of the things in his life using his own physical means. And I told him, you know what? It is good. God will fight for you. But what you need to do is to just commit your case before the Lord. And step back and let God do the battle for you. Hallelujah. That is what Paul is doing here. He says that Alexander, he did me so much evil. So much evil. But I have committed him to the Lord to take care of him. Hallelujah. May that be our lifestyle. Verse 15. He says that of whom be thou aware also. For he has what? Greatly withstood what? Our words. Oh my God. 
Sometimes there are people in the church and they can be so dangerous that they will go behind and tell you that don't believe what they are preaching. Don't, you know that? Oh, I don't think that is true. I mean, all kinds of stuff. That is why it is important that you read the Bible for yourself and let the Holy Spirit deal with you and see if what is being said is true or not. Hallelujah. If you don't do that, somebody can tell you something and you just let go and say, well, after all, all this is just fairy tale. Hallelujah. Take, in fact, take the CDs, listen to them. Listen to them. It's very important. It helps. It helps. You know, it helps. 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Hallelujah. You see, I'm talking about I know whom I have believed. You see the kind of experience he had. Paul, we all talk about his greatness, how he was a great apostle. But this guy went through a lot. And that's what I want you to see. That's just one side. There are so many other things in the other letters that he wrote that tells about his suffering for Jesus Christ. He says that when I stood to give account of my faith, everybody forsook me. I stood alone. I stood alone. To defend myself before the authorities. The Christians were afraid because of the mob. Because the way the people were eager to just kill Paul. They were afraid that if anything were to happen, they would just put all of them together as one. And they would kill each one of them. And so they stood back. And Paul only remained to defend the faith in which he believed. Hallelujah. He said, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Hallelujah. Verse 17, it says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Hallelujah. You may be going through something right now that is very hard, very tough for you. And you may feel that you are just alone and you don't know how you're going to make it through. But just know that the Lord is with you. He's standing with you. Hallelujah. He's going to bring you out of the mouth of the lion and you are going to have a testimony for the Lord. Hallelujah. That is what Paul is saying here. God, he's talking about a living God. Hallelujah. That is why he can talk about the resurrection. Jesus is not dead. He's still among us. He's still listening to people's problems. He's still dealing with their, their struggles and he's healing the sick, casting out devils, giving hope to them that have no hope. Hey, he says that, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Hallelujah. Remember, Jesus taught us how to pray. Deliver us from evil. He says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Hallelujah. That should be your confession in prayer. And will preserve me on, unto what? His heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 19. He says, salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Hallelujah. You know, these were places that he had visited, that he had passed through during his missionary journeys. Homes where he was well received and the gospel was uh, uh, very, very well encouraged. And this is very nice, you know. Let us make our, uh, uh, our, our, our dwelling place a place that is so uh, accommodating of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So that it can be said of us. When I went to so and so's house, oh, I felt so much at home. But when I went there, they were all just fighting and screaming. No. Let us make it a place where we can remember and say, man, my spirit was lifted. Hallelujah. He remembered the places he had been to and the people he had been with and was being thankful to God. And he says, I sal salute her for me. Salute them. Tell them, I appreciate the time I spent with you last night. I appreciate the time I was with you the other day. I, I appreciate it so much. Anytime I'm with you, I'm encouraged. That is what Paul is talking about. Hallelujah. Verse 20, he says that Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Milet, uh, Miletum sick. Hallelujah. You know, there are little, little things in the scriptures that make you see that you have to take the gospel in totality. You just can't take one thing and run with it as if that is the whole thing. 
Paul was a great man. God used him mightily. But he said he left that man sick over there. Do you see that? He left him sick. Something was happening. But Paul, you see, because it's the Holy Spirit who does everything. Hallelujah. When we leave it to the Holy Spirit, it makes a big difference. It doesn't mean that God didn't want to heal that person. But he says, I left him sick. Hallelujah. And so you got to know whom you have believed. Verse 21. He didn't say that because uh, God did not heal him, it means that God is not with me anymore. That's not true. He says, do thy diligence to come before winter. Ibulos greeted these people. They had some weird names, man. I'm sure when, I, when they see Bogla, glad they'll be excited. Hallelujah. <laughs> do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulos <laughs> greeted the Epudins and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. Hallelujah. Verse 22. Say, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. That is your mental disposition. Your, your, your inner disposition. Everything about you should be so composed in Christ. The Holy Ghost is there. You have that consciousness that the Lord is the one who is guiding you. Like the hymn we sang earlier on. You know, while we do his good will, he bi abides with us still. Hallelujah. You know, so Paul is trying to say that if we do these things, there is a great reward for us. Last but not least, I want us to look at Titus uh, chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Let's look at verse 7 to 8. It says that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Affirm, that means talk about this regularly, continually, every time. Never let it go. Talk about it. That is why when we come to church, we always want to spend time in the scriptures. It's not all about just fun and playing and everything, but we want to give importance to the word of God. And he says that, that they which have believed in God, you and I, might be careful to maintain what? Good works. The more we talk about it, the more we learn, the more we conduct ourselves to be in line with the scriptures. Because these things, they are what? Good and profitable unto man. Amen. When we follow the scriptures diligently, the Bible says that it will give us profit. It will make our life better. It will, it will put that in a position where the rest of the world, even though it is burning with fire or in fire, we will still stand. Hallelujah. We will be saved from that Sodom and Gomorrah environment. The Lord will deliver us. Hallelujah. And so what am I trying to say this morning? Paul is saying that I know whom I believe. You know, and he has given us a few things to consider. We talked about the fact that Paul emphasized the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the main reason why he was being accused. And the question is, do you believe that Jesus is risen from the dead? If we can have that belief, it will make a big difference in everything we do. When we believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, it, it means that anytime you open your mouth to speak, you know that God is there with you. Because, like I said the other day, God is as close as your breath. Okay? The fact that you can breathe in and out means that God is in your life. Hallelujah. Think about it. And so just talk to God. Talk to God. So, he is alive today. Paul talked about conscience. He says that I live in all good conscience. So we are trying to encourage ourselves to do likewise. Why do we believe? 
why are we trying to do what we do? You know, uh, we, we want to move on and by the grace of God to do bigger and better things than what and where we are today. And it is going to happen only if we believe in what we are doing. Hallelujah. Paul talked about um, the fact that no, uh, he was accused and they accused him of certain conduct. And it is just because he believed in what he was doing. They said he was the spreader of disease, a pestilent. You know, may it be said of us that we are actually distributing something that is worthy of consumption in this community. The people who are just waiting and desiring to participate and to fellowship with us. And that the work will become very impactful and the whole community will begin to become aware of it. Hallelujah. We see Paul getting close to the end of his life. When he was uh, in prison, begin to, you know, he, he wrote some letters to Timothy and others and uh, he was encouraging them even when he was uh, in trouble. Of course, he mentioned how some people who were supposed to be close friends departed from him. And then there were others who were actually opposing and challenging the faith that he was professing. That is very pathetic. That you can have a brother or sister who once used to come to church with you and all of a sudden they turn around and they begin to say all kinds of evil about Jesus and about the church. You know, that they once cherished. You know, that's what was happening in the life of Paul. But he says that I know. You may say all that you are doing, but I know whom I have believed. Hallelujah. May your conviction be real to you. May your conviction not be based on some kind of flimsy uh, reason, but on facts. Because these are people who have experienced Christ for real. And they have written, documented about it. And you have come and you are also taking it. And you are using it. You got to believe it. You know, when I, I go to the car dealership and, 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 I, and I look at the car that I want to buy, you know, or if I go to any store to purchase anything and I look at a product and I like it and the science has been done, you know, if I take the car, I sit in it, you know, I turn on the ignition and it begins to, I hear the sound. I know, okay, I have to push this, you know, I just begin to move. And I believe that it's going to transport me from point A to point B. I just believe because people have done the research and they have come out of this product. And they've told me that if I use, if I sit in this and, and, and I move and I steer this way, it will help me maneuver all the landscape and take me to my destination. Hallelujah. I don't question them. I just go and sit in the car and I drive and I go. But when it comes to the Bible, it is hard for people to believe that the gospel that has been passed down by our forefathers, it is because they had an encounter with God. And that is why they documented it. The Bible says it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we are sitting and we are doubting. But these are the people who experience God and they are sharing with us. Hallelujah. If, for instance, God were to appear to me in a very unique way today, and I come and stand before you and tell you that this is the experience I had, how many will believe? But this is what he has given us. The word. The word. The word. Let us believe it. Hallelujah. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That is the prayer I pray for you and for me today. That the Lord Jesus Christ will be with your spirit and my spirit. So that we will walk with conviction and live the life of Christ in this community. So that people will be drawn to Jesus. Amen. We'll take the communion.